Hey guys, welcome to RC Video Reviews on Thursday night. It is the 22nd of September. We are heading for the holidays, fellas. I got news for you. Not watching. October is right around the corner. I consider Halloween to be the gateway holiday for the for the holiday season. And that's when it all starts, man. The family, the vacation, the cool weather, at least up here where we live and where I live in the, in the <laughs> northern hemisphere. I know we have Aussies out there who are going the other direction. It's starting to heat up for them. But anyway, welcome to the Pilot Jam. I'm glad you could join me on Thursday night. And um, I think Johan was in first, actually. So, Johan, that was a first, I think, for you. You finally made it. Mr. Skyrider, how's it going? Uh, William Tam says, where is everyone? I agree. Where is everyone? I don't know. I know there's some people on the road and who knows what. The David Knutes is here. Hey, David, how's it going? Uh, Jeff H. Hi from Down Under, another Aussie. Umbrella Corp, greetings. Hobie, how's it going? Hobie, Hobie is, if you guys didn't know, if you're not on Discord and you don't know this, you haven't been watching, Hobie is basically becoming RCVR2 with regard to the airplane hangar. He is, uh, but shh, we're not talking about that very loud. You're not listening. The wife isn't listening with you, I hope. <laughs> don't want to get him into any trouble. But uh, great deals, though. Best deals on the planet. He's getting a lot of cool airplanes at a, at a great price. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Midwest RC, what's up, Tim? It's Tim B. Hey, Tim B. How you doing, my friend? Glad you can make it. Patrick is here. Hey, Patrick, how are you? Philip Jang is here. Four Eyes is here. And Shane Ellis is here. Hello, Shane. And there's Robert. I was wondering where, where, if Robert was going to make it tonight. Haven't, Robert's been quiet on Discord lately. I don't know what's going on. He must be working hard. I, You know, they're getting ready for winter up there where the... Uh, the geese are all heading south, right, Robert? <laughs> so, so uh, all right, let's get started with the week in review. I started with the Radio Master, first look at the Radio Master stuff. We took a look at the Radio Master ER5A and ER5C receivers, and um, I did a little quick demo on how to flash them, the, just to kind of give you guys an idea of how that works. And I took an opportunity to work with the uh, dongle, with the recovery dongle. And the reason I did that is because... I've had a little bit of hit and miss when it comes to Express LRS on flashing over Wi-Fi. Sometimes there's just an error. And I actually asked the, uh, Brian, he's one of the lead, if not the lead developer, I asked him about it and I said, hey, what's the deal with this? And he goes, you know, it's just one of those random things. We don't really know what's going on. So it's probably something inside one of the chips, right, that they don't have that low level access to. So anyway, the dongle, I got the dongle, the, the recovery dongle, the beta FPV recovery tool, and that thing works great. So I definitely recommend checking that out if you get, if you, if you are getting into Express LRS, it will definitely help avoid some frustration let's put it that way and what i what i do want to make clear about that tool is that there's really no way unless you do something power wise oh, and there's the dongle video right there on the side there's really no way unless you do something power wise to uh dam you know like damage the firmware right it's protected so as long as you have that recovery dongle you pretty much can recover just about anything including a bad flash so that's why that tool is so valuable, and uh, that's why I did the uh, video on these guys. The next thing I need to do is put these in a plane. I think I'm going to put one in the Millennium Master and one in my one in my stick. I've got that ugly stick, the blue one. I think those would be perfect candidates for these receivers. And those are the airframes I'll do a little bit of flight testing on and collect some data. So that's the objective is to put these in those planes. Uh, that'll probably happen tonight, actually, tonight or tomorrow. So uh, that was it for the Radio Master stuff. Nice to you so far. It's just a first look. I really don't have first-hand data. And oh, by the way, Radio Master just announced the RP3, which is a Maytech. It's not. I don't want to say it's Maytech uh, copy. It's not. But it's similar to the Maytech 20 R24D, meaning diversity. It's got the diverse antennas, two antennas. It's not true diversity, meaning not not like the Happy model that came out with actually two diverse chips. But it's got dual antennas. And if you guys have been following at all, you know that I really like that Maytech uh, R24D. That thing shows me great results flying. So I'm encouraged that Radio Master's got the diverse antenna option out there as well. So we'll, you know, we'll be we'll be looking. We'll be testing and looking. We'll be seeing what's going on with the Radio Master stuff. So that was the first look in the flash. And then I did the uh, Wi-Fi video. 
I did the Wi-Fi video because I really needed it to be a reference for me because I get asked questions tons about, there's a lot of confusion about like the direct Wi-Fi mode where you actually session in to the device itself into the Express LRS receiver versus having it connect to your home network. So a lot of, you know, I get a lot of questions about it. So I did the video just basically show how the two Wi-Fi modes work and what to expect and how to get them both to trigger. And then once they're both active, how do you connect to one versus the other? So that's what that video is about. And uh, hopefully you guys found some use in that one. And then I thought one of the cool videos, I'm gonna go to the big camera. And this is the one I wanted. I'm gonna go to the big camera because I thought this is one of the cool videos of the week. And that was taking the two uh, six channel ELRS PWM receivers and basically making them behave as a single receiver. And a couple of guys came in with comments about the antenna placement, but that's why I did the, that's why I didn't do a hard mast uh, with the antennas. I, I designed it purposely so you could use zip ties. And the trick, the real trick in this is you bend them the way you want them. And then you hit the zip tie with the heat gun. You just hit it with the heat gun and then you can lay your antennas down however you want. So it's not a bad, you don't want them right next to each other while you're flying because you could get swamping from one antenna of the next, especially since number one is outputting telemetry on the frequency that we're using to connect to the radio. So that was the point. And, but that's also why I use zip ties is so that you can arrange your antennas, however it suits you. So I think this is a cool solution. And then another thing I want to point out about this that I didn't cover in the video, but it would be a very viable thing to do is they don't have to be in the single housing. You could put them in dual housings like these two and then put these in different points on your plane. So think about that for just a second. Like if you had in the, say you had like an 85 inch or a hundred, hundred inch airplane and you didn't want to run servo leads all the way from the back to the front, you could, you could run a power lead back to this receiver and park this receiver in the back and have this one control your elevator and your rudder. Or the one that Brian gave as an example that I really thought was kind of cool is if you had a twin motor airplane, you could put one on each wing and run an ESC into one receiver and ESC into the other receiver. And you could have receivers on the wings without having to run wires all over the place. I thought that was actually a pretty cool idea too. So the point in sharing this with you is that there's flexibility, you know, that's the idea. Uh, you got it. There's flexibility in doing this however you want to do it. Uh, but the cool part is that there is no reason that the transmitter can't talk to two receivers at the same time. And the real answer there is think about broadcast television or radios, right? You have a radio station. Everyone listens to, you know, 100.7, the oldies, whatever. Uh, the same concept, right? You can have all the, all the listeners on a station that you want. And that's the point. So if you just kind of let your mind run with it a little bit, you can actually come up with some pretty darn creative ideas with this. So I thought that was a cool video and I'm going to give credit to Jeff for that. Jeff suggested it. He actually was on discord. He goes, Hey, could you do this? You know, we used to do this free sky stuff. And I thought about it and I also knew uh, there's a video out there that the developers did. Brian, he worked with one of the other developers and they were catch, capturing data points, scatter graphs. And, and what they did is they, they bound all the receivers that they were testing. And this Brian has this video on his YouTube channel, but he connected them all to one receiver using a binding phrase. And he said, you yeah, know, here's how we tested it. There's no question that all the receivers have the same opportunity to capture data. That's what he said. So um, that's where I first learned about it. But the real trick, don't forget the caveat in this is make sure you turn telemetry off on one of the receivers got to make sure you turn it off on one of them all right so anyway cool video i thought that was a neat little feature and certainly creativity abounds right because these re these receivers are not horribly expensive you know they're not terribly expensive so you can come up with all kinds of creative stuff think about a warbird think about doing flaps aileron gear and and uh, a motor on one single receiver on the on the right wing and then doing your other flap aileron uh, esc and landing gear for the other wing on the other wing with another receiver think about that i mean that'd be kind of cool wouldn't it that'd be very cool i think that'd be cool I think that'd be very cool. All right, let me check the comments, then we'll move on. So I'm gonna move uh, Precious out of the way so Robert can get a good look at her. And then we'll see, uh, um, hold on, let's see what's going on here. I'm scrolling back. You guys got chatty while I was in there. Uh, what's up? Saying, Thanks for all the help this week. You're welcome. Um, good evening. Cool weather hit here today. Still hot here, man. It's still it was 85 with a real feel of 96 today. Still hot here. 
Let's see. Trouble. That's what I look forward to the most. Freddy is good at finding trouble. By the way, if you guys didn't know, Freddy's got himself a Tron. Freddy got himself a Tron 5.5 helicopter, and I think he's going to be getting ready to maiden that pretty soon. So uh, Tron, expect a Tron from Freddy at the field soon. Soon. So he does look for trouble, that's for sure. Uh, let's see. Bill is here. Hey, Bill. How's it going? Glad to see you. Richard Webb. Hello. How you doing, Richard? Uh, Mr. Skyrider, J.R. Richard. Okay, got it. She stood right next to me, but I have my headphones. Oh, tricky. Sly. He's he's smart. All right, so Hobie had his headphones in. That's how he kept the uh, boss from hearing about the uh, aircraft expended. It's kind of hard for him to hide it, though. He built a whole rack, and he's got a whole bunch of planes populating those racks now. In fact, he sent me a picture of the XR-52 and the Corsair. So he's got those now. And uh, we have a little plane mule running back and forth between where I live and where Hobie lives. And it's my daughter who's been uh, visiting from college. She's in university and for a couple weeks in a row, she's had to come home. So she's been running airplanes down for us. <laughs> she's, she's our pack mule for airplanes. She's the uh, RCVR delivery service is what it is. All right. Uh, let's see. Bill. Hey, hello. Made it. Hello. Hey, Steven. Oh, Steven Beatty made it. How you doing, Steven? Oh, that reminds me. I don't know. I haven't seen Jeff. I haven't seen uh, High Speed Jeff or Jeff H. And uh, I haven't seen Norm yet. But it looks like they both got their giveaway prizes, too. So remember, Jeff got the uh, balance card that I sent to Arizona. And uh, Norm got the Hobby Eagle programming card. And we're actually going to spend a little time on the Hobby Eagle tonight. So just FYI. Robert says, oh, Bill's looking for the STL. Robert put the link on Discord. There we go. Yep, I'll be using two physically separate R24 P6s for 12. Yeah, that's a cool solution, man. I think, you know, separating them and running them in two different locations on a plane. Boy, talk about solving wiring problems. I mean, think about it. You'd probably spend this much on the stupid wiring extensions for certain airplanes anyway. You know, it's kind of kind of a neat idea. I think it's really cool. Uh, all kinds of flexibility. That's the thing about it. You got to let your imagination run with you. And remember what I said. Don't don't forget to separate the antennas. Don't stand them right next to each other. You got. And if you're watching all the other builds I do, you know that I do that, right? I I, extend, I move them around. You don't have them right next to each other. That's a bad idea. Okay. Uh, 34 watching, eight likes. Yeah. If you guys could hit the like button, that'd be great. Thanks for hitting the like whip, Robert. Appreciate that. Hobie says I was late. Just hit it. Okay. Get him, Robert. Should be nine now. Hey, I actually changed the uh, thing. I'll go back to the desk. Stuff. I actually changed the prompt. I'll I'll bring it up here. It says, it says uh, smash it because I had to give some help. You know, Freddie comes in and Freddie will say things like, "I hit the like button twice." So I actually had to offer a little clarification, and the clarification now says, um, "Hey, hit the smash the like button." And was well, it going to come on or not? Come on, come on, come on. Graphics work with me here. There it is. Smash that like button any odd number of times. See, that's clear. That's a little clarification to help explain if you're a little slow on the uptake. You know what I mean? All right. Thanks for the shout out on the 12 channel. Yeah, Jeff, you're, you're welcome, man. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I went through some education and one thing I learned is you give credit where credit's due. You don't, you don't steal ideas. So that's why I'm always, I'm always diligent about that. And uh, while I was aware of the capability, I never thought about doing a video. So same same thing with the uh, with the uh, boot mode thing, you know, connecting the uh, signal pin to ground. I kind of knew about it. I had read that in passing and just filed it away. Never really thought much of it. But after you mentioned it, I thought, you know, there might be some people who would benefit from that, understanding how that works. So Robert says, Precious has that full frontal lobotomy look. Oh, that's a fresh one. That's cool. Hey, I got news for you. We're going we're gonna to spend some quality time with Precious tonight, Robert. Get your sunglasses on buddy uh, i'll post it in discord on your build log yeah do that your daughter will your daughter be making it to ohio sorry buddy not this time around not this time around okay mr skyrider says banged it on the way in i'm not going to touch that i will leave that one alone Okay, let's see. We'll get back on track with the week in review. So we did the Wi-Fi. We did the 12-channel PWM deal. And then we did the boot mode hack. And all that was, if you guys didn't catch that video, you know, these little boot buttons are fine. They work. And let's get the big camera up here so you can see it. They work. But, you, you know, when you're, when you're trying to hit that boot button and plug in power or connect to your dongle, it can be a little frustrating. And then, you know, you got to find something that's sharp and small enough to go in there and go all the way down. And so the binding plug idea basically just says you connect signal on number one to ground on number one when you power it on, just like a binding plug does. And that puts it in boot mode for you. So it's a cool little trick. It's a cool little hack. And I made a binding plug just by taking a servo extension and 
all I did was cut one end off and then I connected the, the black wire and the white wire. So you cut an end off and then strip the wires, connect the white and black together, bam, you got a binding plug and you got an instant boot, a boot plug for any of these Express LRS PWM receivers. So it's a pretty cool little hack and uh, just makes your life easier. You plug that in and then add power and you're in boot mode right away and you're all, you're all set, off you go. So, oh, the like button, Mr. Skyrider. Thanks for the clarification, buddy. I appreciate you. Appreciate you. I'm glad, I'm glad we got that straight. <laughs> okay. And then, of course, the pilot jam. That was the next thing, uh, the last video of the week. I also did a live video, and it was a live video for that... Uh, it was the live video for the 12 channel receiver. And again, in, during the video, I made one little change to my radio and it screwed everything up. So I didn't like the way that one came out. I killed that video, put it away and made a production video instead. That was the reason for the repost. So I apologize uh, for any confusion on that. I know that seemed like a double post, but in perpetuity, you got to have the right kind of content up there. So I know you guys that are, you know, here and local, you're pretty tolerant of making, you know, people make mistakes. I'm only human. And on a live stream, you have no chance of correcting it. So I appreciate your indulgence, but I had to repost that one because for people who aren't familiar with the channel, they might look at that and go, what the hell is this guy talking about? So I just made it, remade it and took the little errors out. But it was, I think I explained, I didn't explain it in the video. If you guys want to hear about it, I'll tell you about it in Discord. It's fine. Just pop in a Discord and we'll cover it. Okay, so that's uh, that's it for the week in review, and that brings us to content. So let me check. Let me let me get my little uh, tracker here. Oh, the preview. Let's do that. I know Robert's been looking forward to a big dose of precious. All right, here's the deal. I went over to the Edge TX GitHub and I looked at the the milestones and maybe I should bring that milestone up first. Give me just a second. Let me, let me pop that up on the screen real quick. I want you guys to see the milestone screen. So I'm going to put that over here and I'm going to bring the, uh, where's the workspace? Hold on one second, fellas. Let me just bring that workspace up. I want you to see this. There we go. There's the workspace. And I'm going to do a little bit of zooming so you guys can see better. So there, there it is, Flying Dutchman. This is the one that we're looking for. So this is 2.8 and it is due tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, how exciting is that? So here's the deal. I don't know if they're gonna make it or not. And the reason I say that is because I went over to the Edge TX GitHub and I looked at the milestones and it looked like they were, they, they still had some open issues. So here, the, let's just cover the high points real quick for the Flying Dutchman release 2.8, which is due tomorrow, they're, they're saying that they'll have the new graphics backend, LVGL. They've got that. We've seen that. You guys have seen that on the radio a couple of times, so they'll have that. Model labels, they have that. UI main screen changes, got that. UI model select screen changes, they have that. Support for FlySky EL18, I'm pretty sure they have that. And the Radio Master TX12 Mark II, Beta FPV, and the iFlight Commando. I don't really follow those other radios, so I don't know if they have it or not, but I'll assume they do. Uh, IMU support, 6D, 6D, 6D space mouse support. They were testing that at the Edge TX Fest. I know that's a big thing with Risto, and he was showing proof of concept on that. I've actually seen some videos of that working. And then further integration steps for standard peripherals, STM32LL, and a couple of other things, automatic update mode checker for companion, telemetry simulator, blah, blah, blah. So let's uh, now what I want to do is I'm going to bring up the GitHub. So I'm going to just show you guys. Let's see. Edge. Edge TX, Edge TX, uh, GitHub milestones. There it is. That's the one I'm looking for. So when I went and looked at the GitHub, it looks like there are six. In fact, I think earlier today there, I think there were 19 open. Nope, last updated 12 hours ago. So not true. It was 16 open, but 197 issues closed. They're 92% complete. So they're close. They're close. And when I looked at the ones that were open, uh, just to give you guys an idea of what's open out there, it didn't. Now, I'm not a developer, so you kind of have to take what I say with a grain of salt. Uh, but, you know, get source value, API documentation. That doesn't seem like that's something for the radio. Support for FreeSky 8S LiPo sensor. 
you know, they could push that. I wouldn't care if they push that. But here are the options. So you can go look. Um, and, and all you have to do is search like I did. If you go to Google and just do a search for Edge TX GitHub milestones, you'll turn them up. And then you click on the open issues and see what's going on. So it, it bottom line was it didn't look like there were a whole bunch of like radio-based issues left. There were a few. Uh, R9M access fix subtype yeah whatever who cares i don't care about that that thing uh, add option to erase eprom data that doesn't seem like it's you know like a flight related thing japanese radio translation elrs model switching no connection to module so if you you know it's like there's not a whole lot left that's that's the point so it looks like it's getting there it's getting close but I don't, based on what I'm seeing in there, I don't know if they're going to release it tomorrow or not. I don't know. I don't know. You never know with these guys. And I'm not going to badger them because I know they're working hard. So I'm just going to leave it and it'll release when it releases. And But it looks like they're getting close. Looks like they're getting close. So what I thought we would do instead would be to uh, go through a little bit of a look. Let's take a look at the radio. Let's take a look at what's been changed because I have a feeling what we're going to see in the radio as of right now is very close to what you're going to see in production. So I've got my pointer. Let's go ahead and just, I'm just going to take a quick look around and I'll check comments before I do. Uh, Robert says one job. What, what Robert? I wasn't, I was just trying to give you more information. Relax. Go drink some maple syrup, Robert. Bill says, look at her. Ain't she sweet? Oh yeah, she is. You know, Bill, Bill knows. Bill has taste. Uh, Hobie, what a great looking radio. We should make it an RCVR production radio. No, man. Precious stays in, inside in the air conditioning, not in the, not in the heat and the sun. We don't do that to this radio. This, this radio stays on the bench, man. It's a demo radio. We have beaters to take out in the, and beat on in the, at the field. Uh, couch tonight too hot out there waiting for winter to set in so i can get back to billing yeah amen hamilton's hanger lol maple syrup yeah robert robert's canadian and his wife kind of doles out the maple syrup and if he doesn't get enough he gets a little ornery a little cranky and i we, we think he might have tourettes because every now and then he just blurts stuff out it's just you just have to live with it uh it's already 9 23 in oz and flying dutchman didn't happen i don't know what that means i don't know what that means okay so let's take a quick look i just want to give you guys a quick tour of if you haven't seen it, we're not going to spend a lot of time going through configuration stuff. There's Oliver, Oliver, the 3D MXS killer pilot. He Oliver got his MX 85 inch MXS in the air this week. Nice job, looks good. Robert says asterisk percent, asterisk dollar, asterisk ampersand, asterisk you, John, in between two frowny faces with a tear. Hmm. I think I'm being chewed out. See what I mean? He needs to have his maple syrup. It calms him down. <laughs> What's up, Oliver, man? Glad you can make it. Silly joke about time zone differences. Yeah, okay. Flying Dutchman didn't happen. Hmm. Uh, all right. Hard to follow. All right, let's get back into the radio. So I'm going to start out. We'll look at the system menu first. And again, I'm not going to go through everything, guys. I do plan on doing a 2.8 standalone production video. But I thought I would give you guys, if you haven't seen it on your own radio yet, like if you don't have a test platform yet, I thought I'd give you a look at what to expect. And this is what's coming. One of the main things, of course, is the tools menu has been revamped now. So the buttons are much more user friendly. So if you've got an Express LRS module, pretty easy to hit that. So these are, you guys know, these are your Lua scripts, right? So that's a little easier. I am a little surprised these icons aren't a little bigger, to be honest. I thought they would hit that on the first. Maybe that's something planned for later uh, as they worked on the touch layout. I kind of thought these would get a little bigger, but whatever. They didn't. Uh, the SD card navigation definitely did. If you're familiar with the old arrangement, these lines were a lot smaller. This is definitely easier to navigate. Like you don't, here I can hit play. Yeah, that's cool. You can hit play right there. That's actually kind of neat. So the the file the file navigation definitely looks easier for for touch. No question about it. I like where they what they did with that. And they're not being very wasteful of space either. It looks good. Like it's just enough. Right, your fingers you can be pretty accurate. It doesn't seem like I'm missing much when I when I go to click on one of those. Whoops, I just missed that time. But anyway, yeah, it's not too bad. And then under the setup, this is where you're going to really see some changes because they did some groupings. Uh, they went in and if you remember the old layout, it used to be one solid list, right? It was your timers, your sound settings, variometer, haptic. It was all in one single list. Now they've kind of grouped things and trimmed down. I think what they were aiming for here was trimming down to the things you use most common and putting those up front. Um, and you can see the list is much smaller now. The main screen list for setup is much smaller. And then you can get into the various 
subsystems or categories of operation, say for example, sound by clicking on sound. And now all you have on this page are sound settings. And then you can go back by hitting the return button. I wanna see if you go back by hitting the red button. Yes, you do. You don't go all the way out, you just go back one. So it's like hitting the back button, this little logo right here. And then the variometer settings are there and then the alarm backlight GPS. So all of that stuff is kind of categorized. And you'll see that theme carried on throughout the new arrangement. Uh, nothing new on themes that I that I picked up. I haven't long pressed on anything, uh, but I I don't see anything new on themes. It looks uh, the themes look normal. No big changes there. Uh, the global function, same deal. I don't really see any major changes there. They might have done, and I've been looking at this for a while, so they might have done some slight layout rearrangement. I'm not sure, but to me, it's like not material, right? I don't I don't look at it and go, wow, that's way different than last time. And then uh, trainer, the trainer page looks pretty normal. And then the hardware page, um, they definitely did some categorization down here at the bottom. So you've got calibration sticks, pots, slider switches, analogs, and keys. So you, you can go through all that just by hitting the button, you know, getting a look at how the sticks are, are working. And then those other options are still up top. So that all looks very familiar, not a big change there. And then of course the info screen and they added the, I'm not sure where the modules information came in, but they added that recently, it wasn't too long ago go and uh for status i'm i think at some point they're hopefully i think they're looking to get the uh the version number instead of the instead of the uh rate the the rate of the express lrs module i think they're looking for version number in here eventually so there's that and then uh we'll get out of the system settings and we'll take a look at model now they did do some things on the model they they made some real changes here so the first one if you long press the model button now if i long press that that goes into the, well, it used to. Oh, look at that. I managed to freeze it up. <laughs> hey, Edge guys, are you watching? Uh-oh. <laughs> it froze. Yeah, that froze. Huh. See, nightly. Nightly. This is why I don't put this stuff on production, man. So the battery has to come out. I'm locked up. Well, video evidence that's the good news and we should see emergency mode if you're not sure about it we should see emergency mode on here but see that's why i don't use nightlies on my production stuff all right all right we're back to we'll do a long press on model again and get back to where we were going so if you long press on model that brings you in the model selector and i've already done a video on the label thing so i'm not going to go into that in too much detail here but in, in case you've never seen it before these are the new labels for the model selector and i absolutely love this feature i think they did a a, a great job on this i i think it couldn't have been implemented any better so in the favorites you know or the the model selector you've got labels now i think one of the changes is that if you uncheck everything, I seem to recall that if you unchecked everything before, you saw no models, that probably freaked some people out. So I think if you have no filter selected, it shows you everything, but it, whatever, it's, it's the case now, right? It's what they're doing now. So after that, you can apply labels and start filtering down. You'd say, well, I wanna see my 3D helicopters and there you go, you can get 3D helicopters. I think that's absolutely brilliant, great implementation. I'm really excited about this arrangement on the radios now. So well done there. That's very cool okay so that's the model selector we'll go in to take a look at the model setup page real quick and um you've got uh, labels here's where you assign those labels so you can pick and, ch and choose what you want there i'll also let you know that the if you edit a label in the model selector let's just show you rather than make it a question i I'll, i'd rather just make sure you know what i'm talking about so if you come in here and long press one of these and say i want to rename that label from favorite to favorites or favorites to favorite you click on that and hit save watch what it does you, you'll see it it's going to rewrite all the labels so i'll hit save and there it goes it went through and rewrote the label for all my models so if i go back now and hit um, model you can see that if i select the demo list i no longer have favorites i have favorite and that's where that's how that changes so anyway this is where you apply labels and they did the same thing with groupings so same same concept they put like features in groups so your external rf settings for example are in one page your trainer settings are in another page uh, your timer one that's got its own page so you know just kind of grouping things up and you know declutters i gotta tell you i've been using these radios for a long time and i've never used timer three so i'm fine with that i mean i kind of like that they have timer three i would never suggest that they get rid of it but i've never 
never used it. So having it parked, you know, in its own little page, that's, that's cool with me. And then pre-flight checks, if you want to add those, you can display your checklist, turn on your throttle state, check any switch positions. Really very good. Nice and clean. And I do, I like what the, you know, from a, from a touch perspective, I like what they've done here. It's, it's actually very easy to use. I don't feel like I'm missing anything. You know, I, I feel like it's very accurate. So I think they've done a really nice job kind of finding middle ground between where they were and what we needed for touch. I think they've done a brilliant job of that. I know I couldn't have done it any better. Um, I'm a little surprised these center beeps are so small though. I don't know, Raphael, if you watch buddy, <laughs> I personally, I like the consistency. I'd say go big, man. Make that, make it just like the pots and sliders, but you know, they got a lot going on. So maybe, maybe that's for later, but yeah, I would say this probably needs to be the same size. Um, anyway, it's fine. It's just what it is. And then again, trims, if you want to monkey around with your trims and set your trim values, you can do that in, in the trim section. So, you know, they kind of grouped again, features together, right? So the uh, flight modes, I spend a little bit of time in here because I think the, you know, the flight modes, if you've never done flight modes, there's a couple of things I'll tell you about it real quick is that you, first you can assign, first you can put a name on it. So you assign a name to a flight mode, then you can put a switch on it. In this case, I've got SP2 and you can have a fade in and fade out. And really what that's designed to do is if you have say specialized trim or a custom trim for a flight mode, it allows those trim values to be applied gradually rather than, you know, just instant on, which could cause bad behavior. And then in the setup screen, you can decide where the trims come from. So that, you know, either, you know, they equal the zero flight mode zero, or they equal their own, or they equal something else plus their own. So that's where you get the flight, the trim setups for these. And keep in mind, if you use T5 and T6 as momentary switches, if you want to use them, this is where you'd shut those off. You would say, uh, you would say, where's the option to shut them off? Hmm. Oh, you can't do it. In, can you do it in zero? You can't do it in zero. Let's go into this one. Set up. Oh, wait. You know what? It's got to be in zero. That's the problem. Set up. And there it is. T5 is off. There it is. T5 and T6 are off. Right? So in flight mode zero, you can turn T5 and 6 off. Oh, I wonder if I can do that in this one too. I wonder. Let's just check. T5. Oh, there you go. That's how you do it. Whew. All right. <laughs> I thought I was losing it for a minute. Okay. So if you want to turn off T5 and T6's trims, and that way you don't get warned if you use the momentary switch, you start moving the trim up or down, it won't beep at you or give you the trim warnings. It won't say, hey, maximum trim reach. It doesn't do any of that stuff. So that's how you go about doing that if you want to use T5 and T6 for other features on the radio. Okay, so that's how you set up the flight modes. And I'll just show you one more just so you get the idea. Attitude hold, I have that on six position three. And then for setup, I could say, well, this is flight mode two. So I want it to have its own trim. So I would, in order to do its own trim, I would just set everything to equals two. Let's turn five and six off. And I'll set equals two here and equals two here. And what that means is that in this flight mode under attitude hold, it hold it's using its own trim. And, and it won't, it'll ignore any trim values that are set in the other flight modes. So flight mode zero, if I have some specific trims set here and I switch into flight mode two, those trims are ignored. Now there's a lot more to it than that. Trims are just one piece and that's where you set up the trim behavior, but there's you know, there's a lot more that goes on with flight modes and I'll cover that in just a minute. I just wanted to give you a look real quick. So pay attention at the bottom where I have gyro off and we have the numbers one through six. When I start pressing these buttons, that's when the flight mode changes, right? So you can see I've got wind rejection now. Sorry, I've got wind rejection and then attitude hold. And I think I had one more self level. Okay. So that's, that's how you can tell what flight mode you're in visually. And of course you can have prompts. You can have audio prompts if you want to do that as well. So a lot of options there, but so that's the trim setup. Let's go into model settings again. And I want to show you more about flight mode. So that was the flight mode tab. That's right here. Now I'm going to show you something else about flight modes and that's how they can be used. So notice in this one, I've I've got flight I've got flight modes turned on for two, three, four, two, basically two through eight, but not zero and one. Okay. So what that means is on the input, if I'm in flight mode zero or one, I should have no output on that input so that, that there's nothing, you notice no, nothing happening here. There's no data getting to the mixer. There's no data going to the output. It's because I have that uh, input only turned on for flight modes two through eight. So now if I go into flight mode three, notice that that went gray. And if I press the model button, now I've got movement on my channel one. Okay. So 
I haven't really personally, I haven't found a use for this yet. I know there are some, and you know, for people who have complex configurations, say you want to do knife edge mixes or, you know, flaps and elevator mixes or 3D mixes where you do flapperons and elevator, you could, that would certainly be one way to do that, right? Certainly one way to do that. And that's by assigning flight modes. So I personally have never used them. I've never used them in that way, but that I'm just trying to show you that when you go into edit here, you can select different flight modes and say with the gear icon and say, where do you want this input to be effective? And I made it effective in two through eight by highlighting those and then turning them off for zero one. If I wanted them available in zero one, I could just turn that on. And if I do that, notice the flight mode, uh, information went away there, right? You get that? Okay. So anyway, there's flight modes. And also, by the way, surprise, surprise, you can also do it in mixers. You should be able to go into mixers and say, I want that available only in flight modes one and two. Oops, sorry. I did it backwards. So we'll turn all the rest of them off. Now what happens is in my mixer, and we can turn the mix line on too, by the way. So in the mixer, you see how we have nothing moving on this mix line? That's because I'm in flight mode three. I have it in flight mode three. If I go into flight mode two, now it's back on because I have it turned on. Sorry, that's, that's flight mode one, button two, my mistake. Or if I go into flight mode zero, it works again because I have it turned on for flight mode zero and flight mode one, which are assigned with these two switches. Let me see if I can get the whole thing in frame. There we go. So there's flight mode zero on button one and then flight mode one, which is on button two. Now, if I go into flight mode two, which is on button three, it doesn't work. You get it? So, you know, and keep in mind, if I look at the monitor, now I can still see, uh, there, should, there still should be an input uh, or sorry, what I'm thinking about is a mix and output. So if I have the, if I have the mix on, but the output off, that'd be another way to control it too. If you wanted to use a mix, you could by leaving the mix on and then in outputs, you could go in and I think, nope, there's no flight mode option in here. So that's it. That's it. <laughs> flight modes are on input and mix only. See, I, I don't use it. That's why I'm not, I don't have it committed to memory. That's why. Okay. So that's it on the flight modes on the mix lines. Uh, they, again, this was a, a little bit of compromise or a lot of people talking about the need for it to be compressed and much smaller. So they get much more of a view on one page. And again, they had to compromise in order to make it touch friendly. At some point you have to give a little to get, you know, so they had to give up that compact view in order to make it touch friendly enough for us to work on it with our fingers. So that's kind of what we're left with. And I think they've done a pretty good job compromising. You know, I think they, they've done a very good job finding middle ground. And so in channel one, if I wanted to do a secondary, maybe mix is a bad place to do it. Let's do it on inputs. Uh, if I wanted to add a second input on my elevator, I could simply click on this guy and hit copy and then click on it again and hit insert after. And that will make my second line right there on the elevator. And I can go in and edit whatever I need, you know, change the curve or expo or weight or whatever. So uh, that's that. So that that's what the secondary lines look like for either the input or the mixer. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm kind of hoping they go to a swipe. <laughs> I don't know if they're going to or not, but I, I, you know, we're smartphone users, right? This tendency is to swipe. I want to swipe. So I keep thinking that uh, when I look at these screens, you know, I, I want to go like that. Um, so I'm hoping they add that later. So anyway, the mix screen, we just kind of covered that. I'll look in the mixer real quick and make sure there's nothing I'm missing, but I don't think so. Uh, the one thing I'll say about the mixer is if you go into the uh, tool option, there's a multiplexer where you choose the multiplex options, add, multiply, or replace, and then your delays, your speed ups, and whether or not you want trim applied and your flight mode. So yeah, it's just, again, it's a tidy up, right? It's, it's definitely a, a little bit of a different layout than, than the old style, but it, it's definitely a little, a little different. Outputs didn't change much at all. Uh, keep in mind, they do have, I want to point out a little nuance here. Notice on this screen, let's, let's point this out. You see how they've got the monitor capability right here on the side and you can turn that on and off. So if you don't want that there, you can turn that off and that reclaims some space. So now that's off. But if you want to turn it on, you can hit on and now the monitor is there so you can see it while you're setting your model up. And then after you're set up, you know, you could turn that off again, but pay attention to the color. So notice the mixer is red. And if we look at the channel monitor, you see the mixer right here is red and red, you get it? So red and red, that's the mixer. And that's what they're showing you here. They're showing you red. That's not the output, that's the mixer. So that's all you see on this page. Then when you go to the outputs page and you 
you have that output line, you notice how that's now blue? That matches the output on, on the channel monitor of being blue. Okay, so blue is outputs in my case, based on my theme, blue is outputs, red is the mixer. And on the, on the main pages, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing blue on the output page and we're seeing red on the mixer, okay? Just a little nuance. Wanted to make sure you guys you know, were aware of that and knew it wasn't somebody with a coloring crayon just getting a little crazy. So that's that. And then as far as the output configuration though, not really much to change there. Um, if I hit edit, I think this looks very familiar to the original layout. I'd have to see them side by side, but they look very similar. I don't really see anything dramatically different there. Just maybe some layout stuff. The, uh, the inverted option now is a slider instead of a checkbox, and that's about it. So, and then the add trims to sub trims right there at the top, which is great. And then the curves, you know, this is another one I keep, I keep, there it is. It's, it's, let me hit it. I keep wanting to hit edit. I don't know. There it goes. I don't know what the deal is with that. <laughs> I'm having a heart there. <laughs> okay. Oh wait, do you have to hit it in the blank space? Yeah, maybe that's the issue. I must have been hitting it in the curve space or something. Maybe you gotta hit in the yeah, you gotta hit in the blank space. Okay. Monkey meat football, right? Okay, so in the curve editor, this is another area where I'm kind of hoping that they do touch for these curve sliders, you know, these points. Uh, I think they will at some point, but right now, you know, there's baby steps. So um, hopefully that, that that changes and you can drag these. It'd be nice to be able to move them about where you want them and fine tune using the numbers. That'd be awesome. But other than that, I really don't see any real, nothing dramatic here on the, on the curve editor. And then for the rest of them, under global variables and logical switches, everything looks very common to the last one. Uh, so you hit logical switch and edit and everything in here looks very much the way it used to look before so i don't see anything really new there and i don't really see much different on the telemetry screen so there we go that's a front to back you know tour of what's going on with with a uh, lvgl and the new graphics layout on edge tx and i'm excited you know i, I think it's great what they're doing i'm i'm okay I, it's definitely different you know there's no question about it it's different it looks a little different than what we had before but it's all right man i'm cool with that uh, so I'm going to scroll back up and check the comments and then we will move on. Let's see. Um, howdy, 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 dude. He needs to dial back the maple. No, he needs more maple syrup. It's like a sedative, Oliver. That's the thing. Uh, let's see. Flying Dutch is 2.8 name. Oh, Flying Dutchman. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. It's 923 over here. He's, oh, I see. It didn't happen yet. I think they work off of like London time. So Yeah. It's uh, actually, it's now 923. Let's reload the page. I want to reload the page and see if they, if they did anything. Uh, I'm just curious. I, I, I don't know. It's probably late there. Who knows? Thursday night up oh, still 16 open. So yeah, it's, I don't think it's moving that fast. I don't think it's moving that fast. All right. Uh, sausage fingers. Okay. Oliver hit the like button. What's up, Hobie on it. Did you get up flying today? A little chat. Uh, Robert says one job day two. Okay. Thanks Robert. Thanks for calling me out, bro. Appreciate you. <laughs> it's all good fun. I know it's good fun. Robert's got a kind spirit. Uh, let's see. Ollie, what do you think of the edge stuff? Oliver's Oliver's a JR guy, man. Yeah, he's a JR snob. He's a JR snob. I got no shame in my game, Hobie. I really dislike the new chunky UI and edge. Yeah, you know, it's not gonna be for everybody. Um, I know that I know that's gonna be for some people a little disappointing, but you know, here's the deal: 2.7.1 uh, is excellent, and it doesn't really change much in terms of the graphics, a little bit. So if you want to and you don't like the graphics, you feel feel free to stick to 2.7.1. But I don't think they're going backwards, man. So you know, it's you have a you have a choice. Right? I've talked about this before. You can either you can either hug it or you can hate it. Um, it's your choice. Whatever makes you happy. You guys know what I say, man. It's your money, your hobby. Do your thing. Do what makes you happy. All right. Hobie says, I like it for my fat fingers. Yeah, the touch screen, I think it, it definitely works. It works. I like it. Same here, Hobie. When my thumb covers a third of the screen, it's nice. I agree. Need a bigger radio. Do you even fit on the on the sorrows? Zorro. <laughs> Autocorrect. If they let you touch drag the curve, I hope you can lock the point in a single axis. Yeah, I... Um, I don't know what you mean about lock the point in a single axis. I know on a curve editor, you can set it to custom and move both directions. Uh, hopefully they let you, oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Like in the simulator, when you can lock one of the sticks. Yeah, I got you. So you can either move it left or right or up and down. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. I get you. I feel you. Yeah, that'd be a cool feature. No doubt. Uh, with the 3D Canadians like Meth Man, they go crazy. 
they love it. Flight modes can be very useful if you want different combinations of server rates for Xbox. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, except again, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't get into that kind of stuff. I just fly the thing. I don't, I don't get into too much mixing. One mix I kind of liked was when I was messing around with that little Sabre 920, I did a mix where I had the ailerons used as uh, kind of like flapperons and spoilerons together with the elevator. That was cool. <laughs> it did some neat things with that. So that was fun. Uh, so you can't drag the point. Yeah, I think we covered that terminal insanity. Jeff says flight modes can be useful if you want. Yep. Okay, good. All right. So that's it. That's it on the first look on the radio. So let's go back to the desktop and I got to see what's up next. Let's see. Uh, that was the Edge TX preview. Next up. Holy smokes. We got to still do the Hobby Eagle. It's almost time to quit. It's quitting time. Somebody's got a drink for me somewhere. <laughs> I still got the Hobby Eagle to go through. All right, let's go through the Hobby Eagle. Let's get her done. I want to bring up the workspace here. We're going to hide this thing. Don't, don't need this anymore. And let's see. I don't really think we need... I'll leave the camera. I'll leave the camera. We're going to let Robert's eyeballs take a break from Precious. So I'm going to just set Precious aside here. And I'm going to get the Hobby Eagle out. And I've got... The I just want to show you guys you can't just plug USB you got to have the Hobby Eagle comes with the little it, I guess it's probably a FIDI adapter I, my guess is it's probably just like uh, that USB dongle in fact I'd like to now it just says data that's proprietary but I'm sure I'm sure that's what it is it's a USB to serial converter I'm I'm convinced so you have to plug this in on your computer and then the other end goes into the Hobby Eagle. And I actually do need Precious back out here because I want to show the I want to show the S bus working so you guys can see that. So and then one one little power wire from an ESC by a battery, and now we've got power to the receiver. And I do actually need to turn the radio on. Sorry, Robert, you're going to be stuck with Precious for a little while longer. Okay, so there we go. We've got a, now we've got a bind. That's what the green light indicates. We have a bind. And as far as the connections go, the USB cable goes on the top of the Hobby Eagle. And then on the, on the, let's just do the big camera so you guys can see it clear. Uh, so this is the receiver is the, S, this is an S bus receiver. So I have an S bus converter on the, uh, on the, I'm using an EP, EP2 with a little ceramic and I've got an S bus converter from Maytech and that's connected to the serial port on the Hobby Eagle. Okay. So one single wire from the receiver into the S bus port on the Hobby Eagle. And then to give it power, I'm just using a BEC standard BEC off a of standard ESC connected to a four cell battery. Okay. So that's the wiring. That's all I've got. And then of course the USB up front in the data port. Okay. So that's the wiring. And then the radio, I'm just going to pop the radio up so everyone can see it. I am going to hide the chat because right now that's not helping us. So I'm going to put the radio there and I do need to zoom out a little too. So let's just back the camera up just a touch. There we go. Okay. There we go. Let me hide the chat and we can get into, we can get into the hobby Eagle. So there we go. Now I'll bring the workspace up and I've got the Hobby Eagle software right here. And the reason I wanted to do this is because there are a couple, I know, I know some of you are getting this thing, you're getting the Hobby Eagle. And if you haven't seen my material on this, here's why I like the Hobby Eagle A3 Super 4. And it's because you can reconfigure the output on the Hobby Eagle 4. They just look at it the way I like to look at things. They just say, look, it's just an output. It's output one, two, three, four, five. You can configure those to be whatever you want. So you can remap pins if you want. And that's really cool, right? So on the S bus stream, keep in mind on a PWM stream on these, you know, in the UI on the browser, we can remap pins on, on the browser. You know that, right? You watch the videos. You should know that. But on SBUS, you cannot remap the pins. You can't do it. So if without without the ability to remap an output, you would lose uh, channel five output because that's an arming switch. You, you have to use that to arm the receiver or tell the receiver it's armed. And without the ability to remap, you lose one of these pins, which would turn this from five outputs to four which is not very good, not very good. And the other issue is that a lot of these don't support throttle output and this one does. So that's why I like this gyro for use with, with the, with the express LRS, because you can, you can remap all the outputs, which means you can re recover channel five and use it for something else. 
and it's, it'll support throttle out. So remember, throttle out, if you have an SBUS receiver that doesn't have any PWM pins, you don't run the ESC to this. You can't. It doesn't work that way. A lot of these, a lot of these uh, SBUS receivers have PWM pins, and you can run the throttle off of it. So just keep that in mind. That's that's why the Hobby Eagle A3 Super 4 works for this arrangement. It's why it works. And, and it's it's basically out of the box. You don't need to do anything unusual to the, the S-Bus configuration or really the gyro configuration in order to get this to work. So with that out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and hide the camera because we really don't need it. It's just, I just wanted to see you to see that it's plugged in. And I'm gonna bring this window, I, I can't make it any bigger, but I'm gonna put it right there in the center. And I've just got to lock a couple things real quick. So they, whoops, hold on. There we go. There we go. We're getting there. Perfect. Okay. So there we go. So there's the configuration screen. I just want to go through the basics with you guys and give you an introduction to how this is configured. So the Hobby Eagle software, you can download it from Hobby Eagle. It's all over the place. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. And um, I've been really impressed with this thing so far. I think the software is actually really very good. So in the basic, in the these are tabs across the top. So we've got basic, wing type, orientation, receiver, outputs, sensor, and advanced. Okay. We're going to start with basic and work our way across. First at the top on the mode switch, what I one thing that I really like about this one is you can set the mode switch to be whatever you want. So if you want all three positions to be off, which would be kind of stupid, I don't know what point you'd have in having a, a gyro if you turn them all off, but you could, <laughs> you could turn them all off. You can set them to whatever you want. So if you want position one to be normal and position two to be hover and position three to be user, you can do that. I'll talk about this user thing in a minute, but normal is wind rejection and then hover basically means you put it into a hover and it, you just manage the throttle and it takes care of the rest. Normal is wind rejection. Uh, lock mode is, is, uh, I believe that one's an, it's an added, it's a, it's a 3d mode. So whatever 3d mode you put it in, when you let go of the sticks, it holds it there. That's lock mode. Angle mode is what you'd use to train somebody. So you can limit the angle. We'll talk about the maximum angle in just a moment, but that's how you can limit the angle. Level is auto level or chicken switch. So whatever attitude you're in, you hit this one and it returns itself to level. Hover, I talked about, and user, we're gonna cover that next. In the user mode, you can define what every surface does, which I think is also very cool, very configurable. So if you have a mode and you define it as user for position three, you can say, I want wind rejection on my aileron and my elevator, or you could say, hey, let's do angle on the elevator so they can't pitch down or pitch up too far. It might be nice to do angle on this one, and then for rudder, we'll just do wind rejection, okay? So in this mode, you can define whatever parameters for the gyro or performance behaviors you want out of the gyro on a per surface basis. Very cool little feature. And then maximum angle, I told you we'd get to that. In the maximum angle mode, if you set up an angle mode as one of your modes, you can say, I don't want the plane to go any more than 40 degrees on roll and no more than 50 degrees on pitch, for example, or whatever, you know, whatever you want. If you don't want to, you know, got a real young pilot and you want to keep them real, you know, real gentle, set it at 30 and 30. And that limits the roll and pitch so they can't go any further than 30 and 30. Next up on the gyro settings, you can turn them on and off. So if you have elevator two or rudder, you can, you can turn them off if you want to, um, and you can reverse them if you need to. So the thing about setting these up is you have to make sure that the, the, let me just bring the camera back up real quick. You have to make sure when you're setting your plane up that your surfaces work with the gyro off the way they're supposed to here first. That's step number one. Your radio has to have them working correctly with the gyro off. And then after you've done that, you turn the gyro on. And if one of the surfaces is not moving the way it's supposed to, you can reverse it in here. Okay. So that's how you do that. Those are the steps that you take. Now, I think this is the one that costs most people the, the, the most uh, alarming situation where they, they look at the, the gyro and they're like, wait a minute, what is all this gain business about? Well, let's just carve it up and make it easy. So first off, there are three columns. You got aileron, elevator, and rudder. Okay, so that's easy. Th these are gain values for the aileron. These are gain values for the elevator. These are gain values for the rudder. Okay, that's simple. So right away, we've made it a third as difficult as it looks right off the bat. So the next part is basic gain. That's the overall basic gain for when you're in that wind rejection mode. So just basic gain where it just rejects uncommanded movements. I call it wind rejection mode. Other people call it other things. That's fine. 
I'm okay with that. I stick with wind rejection mode because that's what makes sense to me. So wind rejection means the wind blows, the plane says, nope, let's go back to where we were. It's a momentary correction and then the server returns to wherever it was. So it doesn't hold it, it just does a momentary correction, that's it. So that's what basic gain is for. Lock gain, remember we talked about that over here. If you put it in lock mode, and say, you know, say knife edge, for example. If you put it into a knife edge and then let go of the sticks in lock mode, it will hold that position. If that position's not being held correctly, you can increase the gain. Let me move this up a little bit so you can see it. So you can increase the gain, right? If it's not being held correctly, you can just bump that gain up just a little bit. That makes sense? So that's what the lock mode gain is about. And that goes across the board. So you have it for aileron, elevator, and rudder. Then angle gain, same deal. There's no rudder command because remember, we're only looking at roll and pitch. We don't really govern the rudder and angle gain. And it's the same deal. It says, how forceful do you wanna be about maintaining that angle? So we, we go to a point and we're gonna enforce no more than 30 degrees and that's it for angle gain, right? So that's the gain there. Level gain is the auto correction. So if you have to, if you hit the chicken switch and you need it straightened out, how rapidly do you want it to return? I can tell you I did some testing and I really like 50% for this one because it doesn't snap back violently. It just kind of, it just says, okay, if you hit the, if you hit the chicken switch, it just says, okay, let's just straighten out. <laughs> and it's very, it's very comfortable feeling. Like it's, it's almost like when I was flying in the, when I was getting my pilot's license, I remember flying with my instructor. If I ever got into trouble, she would say, I have command and she'd take command of the airplane and she would just get it back to where it was going. She didn't jerk the stick and flop it around. And a lot of gyros do that. Like if you hit the chicken switch, it's like, you know, there it's rapid movement. And I was really impressed with the way this one returned to neutral. Now, if you need it to be quicker, this is where you'd adjust that. You'd increase this one. And then hover gain, obviously elevator and aileron are sorry, elevator and rudder are super important for a hover. I'm a little surprised they don't do aileron, but I guess they probably don't have a way to measure it if the gyro is straight up and down. That's my guess, that's my guess. So that's it. So, so for the gain, now you have an idea. And also don't forget that you have a remote master gain that you can assign to a switch, and that will basically elevate all gains. It's like, if you remember, think about an equalizer on an old stereo system, right? You have an equalizer, you, you bring up the bass, you bring up the mid-tones, you bring up the treble, uh, but you can also hit the overall volume, the master volume. That's what the master gain does. It brings all of them up, okay? So that's what the master gain on the radio does. If none of them, you know, if they're not performing the way you want, you need a little more, you can, you can juice it a little bit on the radio and give it a little bit more oomph for the gain. Okay, so that should explain the gain, hopefully thoroughly enough for all of you guys. The wing setup, I don't think we need to spend much time in here because it is what it is. I'm standard, you got flying wing options and you've got a V-tail option. So pretty self-explanatory there. Uh, basically a T-tail, ailerons or wing or V-tail. So real easy to understand that one. Orientation, the one thing I'll say about this one is you can't turn it around backwards. So they always want on this one, the heading direction to be facing the, basically the pins faced aft and the, the solid part, the data port, that always faces forward. That said, you can rotate it. You can, you can say, well, it's gonna be face down, face up. You know, they don't mind if you do this kind of thing to it, but it has to be, uh, it has to be uh, facing forward. Uh, there's, no, there's no alternative for that that I've been able to find. Okay, so that's the orientation. The receiver, this is just basically where you can check your work and make sure things are working. So this is an S-Bus configuration for the Crossfire. I just gotta stop saying Crossfire, dang it. I've gotta break myself of that habit. For CRSF to PETA, for, for CRSF to S-Bus, uh, that's the board that I have on this receiver. Uh, the selection you use is serial digital receiver right here, serial digital, the bottom one, and just leave it on Fataba S-Bus and it works fine. So I've got my aileron, elevator, rudder, and aux one. Aux one you can see is assigned right here to channel three, okay? So that's aux one. And then I don't have gain set up or mode set up on this one, but you get the idea, right? You get the idea that it does work. I would just have to add a channel in my mixer and we'd be good to go. And then for outputs, uh, we have, remember I told you you can remap the outputs, right? So you don't lose channel, if you have channel five on this receiver, uh, I don't have, right here I've got channel five on mode, but I can, I can make this anything I want. I can make it channel seven for mode, okay? So you can map what comes in and you can map what goes out, which is super cool, because now I can say for these pins, out one, out two, out three, out four, out five, I have control of what goes on them. So on out one, I want those to be my ailerons. Out two, I want to be elevator. I can make that one elevator 
uh, one, and I can make out two elevator two, and then I can say out four is aileron two, and out five is my aux, what was it, aux one, that's the throttle? Yeah, there's my throttle. So there we go, now I've got aileron, and I've got dual ailerons, dual elevators, and uh, a throttle. Now keep in mind, there's only five. So if you want rudder to be output, then you, one of them has to be used for rudder. So you might wanna say, well, we'll use the rudder for yeah, elevator two, and there we go. So now we've got rudder control, we've got throttle control. And so the bottom line is you can remap these five, you get five, five is what you get, and you can remap them to whatever you want, okay? That's, what it, that's the bottom line. And then regarding the sensor, there's a level calibration. I don't really wanna do it, because I don't, I don't, I'm not sure this table is flat, flat right now, but if you wanna do a calibration, you can. And then if you do a hover calibration, you click this button, and it'll wanna know, okay, what's straight up and down so I know what a hover is. So keep in mind on level calibration, you need to do that on a flat surface, okay? Do that on a flat surface. And then uh, that's it. Uh, under advanced, uh, there's some really cool options for advanced. One of my favorites is that you can go in and set your servo speed. And I thought this was fantastic, man. 333 hertz, can you believe that? That matches up perfectly with Express LRS uh, and most digital servos. So you can send 333 hertz out. If you've got 333 in, you can send 330 out, 33 out to your servos. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. I, I, I'm impressed with that. Uh, gain level, this just lets you, it basically changes the amount of gain or the amount of tension in the system. I've just left mine for all my 60 inch planes on medium. If you feel like it's pushing a little too much for a smaller plane, you might want to reduce this. And for your gyro filter, they say 20 Hertz is appropriate to reduce interference when the vibration is strong. So if you're, if you don't have a lot of vibrations, you can go up on the low pass filter. You can bring it up a little bit higher. Uh, I've actually, I've actually been flying mine on 42 and I haven't seen any ill effects and all low pass filter does is remove remove vibrations or anomalies on the gyro at that frequency. So if you've got some low frequency vibrations, maybe from a prop or a nose cone, you might have to go a little bit lower. But if you've got a really clean running plane, you can bring it up a little bit higher. You can bring that up a little higher. And then when you're done, all you have to do is hit right. You hit right and say, it'll say, do you want, well, let me put, I gotta hide the stupid camera because it just got in the way. So I'll hit right, there we go. And we got a little prompt. Are you sure you wanna write these to the controller? You say yes. And there you go. So there's the Hobby Eagle A3 Super 4 top to bottom. Just went through basically every single option. I think I got every single option on this thing. Oh, stick dead band. I didn't cover that one. Stick dead band is uh, if you feel like you need a little less sensitivity in the middle, you can adjust the stick dead band. So, and if you're not sure what it means, you can hover over the help and it's not giving me any help. So it looks like it should be, but it's not. I'm not getting any help. So bottom line is if you if if your center feels a little twitchy, you might have to add a little den band. That's what you do there if your middle feels a little twitchy. All right, let me go back to the desktop and I'm gonna check questions and we're gonna wrap it up. This has been a long one tonight. It's been an hour. All right, let's see. Autocorrect with third Canadian. Okay, method. Let's see, see. Can't drag the point. Yep, got that. Flight modes can be very, yep, got that. It's trying to make your, okay, just finished it. Four rows. Uh, Ricardo says component price is stupidly expensive companies releasing unfinished product after unfinished product inflation and interest rates out of control no longer in the RC obviator to use. Well, sorry to hear that Ricardo. I'm having a lot of fun. I still have some pretty good gear and pretty good price. So, um, you know, I've been having a good time. Sorry. Your experience has been different though. Uh, terminal insanity. The older stuff was fun though, right? Surely you can find finished products at work. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I can attest the fact that the RP2 doesn't have polarity protection and becomes a smoke generator when the voltage... Yeah, I've done that. I actually did that with the uh, R24D. Yeah, I was kind of pissed about that. I plugged in my M8S and saw S-Bus activity. Yeah, that's cool. The M8S will do it. One thing I'll tell you guys about the... Uh, one thing I've noticed about it, and I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you. You know, I know a lot of times you guys probably think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I say it all the time. My mom had me test it. I'm not. So let me, I'm going to go back to the workspace, wrong one. I want to bring this one up and I want to show you guys something. So right now, if I'm going to bring the camera up so you can see exactly what's going on. So right now, if you look at the, my stick and the screen, right, you can see that I'm moving the aileron and everything looks nice and smooth, right? Everything looks really good. It's all copacetic. It looks beautiful, like just the way it's supposed to look, right? Everything looks good. Now, watch this. I'm gonna go into Express LRS under system, Express LRS, and I have to unplug the receiver because it's not gonna be happy about me changing this if I don't. So let me just unplug the battery on the receiver real quick. And I'm gonna go and change my packet rate from 100 to 333. 
which is fine. It's fully supported, no issues. And I'm gonna set the channels to 16 channels. Uh, there it is, 16 channel uh, half rate. Okay, so that's a normal configuration on this radio here. In case you didn't see it up close, that's what I did. I set the packet rate up top right there at 333 hertz, and I set the channels to 16 half rate, okay? Now that's a perfectly acceptable mode because remember, the gyro can deal with 333 hertz output to the receivers or the, the servos, right? So I'll back out of that now. And once that's written, uh, come on, get out. Okay, now I'm gonna plug it in and we're gonna get a bind on the receiver. So we're looking for the solid, there's a solid green light. Now watch this, watch what happens when I move my, you see how what happens when I'm moving those sticks on that screen? They're all choppy, it's not following me. Look, I'm all the way to the left and look what the aileron's doing, <laughs> right? So I'm not sure, I'm not sure, it's software. When, I, when this first happened, I thought, oh man, this is terrible, this is not gonna work with the receiver, it's not gonna work. I thought something was wrong with the S-Bus implementation on the card. I thought there were all kinds of problems. I was like, man, what the hell? What is going on here? Well, it turns out that the Hobby Eagle really doesn't like to see that much of a refresh rate inbound on the software. Uh, the, the gyro passes it through to the servos just fine. I've flown it, it's fine. It doesn't exhibit this behavior at all. So it's just one of those things, I think it's a software bug. Hobby Eagle, if you're watching, y'all need to fix that. <laughs> you need to fix that. And by the way, the M8S does the same thing and I'll show it to you. I will prove it. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take this receiver off. We're done with the Hobby Eagle. I'm gonna put that away. I'm just gonna move all this stuff out of the way. And I'm gonna show you the same thing on the M8S and the M9, they all do it. It's something about the, it's something about the rate. I wanna make sure I put this in the right way because I don't wanna turn anything into a smoke grenade here. Okay, so there, all I did was plug that into the uh, M7AC and I, I get the same issue, it's the same exact thing. So we'll go under signal, measure signal, and I'm gonna put it on S bus and you see it? I don't, here, I'll put, I, I'm gonna go into the big camera cause we don't need the thing, we don't need the screen, we don't need the, we don't need the uh, application on the screen anymore. Okay, so here we go. You see that? You see all that lag between on number one as I go back and forth? Now it's not flopping around like the Hobby Eagle did, but look at that lag. Like you, you see what I'm talking about, right? That's terrible, that's terrible. I was freaking out when I first discovered this, like man, this is a serious problem, but it's it's not it doesn't happen in flight, so it's got to be something to do with these devices that are interpreting that that signal. But if we go in and we take that rate back down again, just set it to 100, and uh, I don't think it's going to let me have 16 channels with that one. What happened there? Express LRS. Okay, it doesn't let me have 16 channels. Okay, so I have it set at 100, and I'm going to plug it back in. We'll get a bind really quick, hopefully. There we go. And now look how smooth that is. You see what I'm talking about? So yeah, I told you guys, I'm not crazy. My mom had me checked. I'm telling you, there it is. And look how nice and smooth that is. So just be aware, if you're running at these high packet rates on Express LRS, you're gonna see it in software, like we just saw on the Hobby Eagle, and you're gonna see it in devices like this one, because right now that's the way it should look, right? That's following my finger almost exactly. It feels very smooth, it looks very fluid, everything looks correct. So I just wanted to point that out to you guys. If you see that while you're testing, the reason is it's your packet rate. So all you gotta do is bring your packet rate down to 100. You can do all your testing, and then when you're done, and you're ready to fly, put it back where you want it. That's all you need to do, because you're not relying on these uh, devices to, to tell you. The odd thing is, it's happening on multiple pieces of hardware and software, but in the plane, it works just fine. Um, and and you, you can tell, all you gotta do is plug a servo in and run it, you'll see. It's just fine, it's no problem. So I, it's an interesting little thing, and I think it's just a function of, uh, I think it's really just a function of older stuff, you know, like these devices, these toolkit RCs and the, uh, and the uh, Hobby Eagle programming software to get caught up with the reality that we've got some ridiculously insane packet rates these days. I think that's what's going on. So if you click on this and keep in mind, these go all the way up to a thousand. There's F1000. <laughs> Just keep that in mind, man. There's a lot happening at a thousand hertz. It's quick. Okay, let me go back to the desktop and we're gonna wrap this one up.
Uh, let's see. I think you're crazy. And I know, I, know, <laughs> I think we're all a little crazy, right? Uh, I want to, let's see. Plug, I'm going to go back up here. Nice job. Good content tonight. Okay. I'm keep going. Hobie says, I plugged in my M8S, saw S bus activity. Good. Bill says, nice job. Good con tonight. Well, thanks, Bill. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, Hobie says, I plugged in the HE and everything worked. Awesome. Good. Glad to hear it. I want a tiny, oh, he's the, hopefully you're talking about the HE programming card. Hobie got himself a Hobby Eagle programming card too. I want a tiny, tiny foam plane that can run off, run off of 1S 18650s. You know, they have quads that do that, man. There's quads that run off of 18650s. Only one user issue. I had set up channel eight and nine for mode and game. Um, that seems like it should be okay. Robert says, I think you're crazy. And I know, I know you're crazy. Okay. You know, I know you're crazy. Yeah. He's yeah. Robert's probably right. A little bit, just a little, you gotta be a little crazy to do this stuff. Don't you? All right. Uh, Terminal and Sandy says, I saw a really nice one that fit perfectly, but it's out of production. I've been looking into building my own out of foam board though. Okay. Well, good luck. Let me know how it works out. Uh, Hobie says UMX planes. Yeah. Do they, I don't know if UMX supports 18650s. All right, let's see. Lag equals expo. Yeah, that's not. But see, the thing is, Hobie, that that lag that you saw, that's not. That does not manifest itself actually to the servo. It's only in the software that it's interpreting the signal. It doesn't happen all the way down to the servo. Just keep that in mind. All right, that's disappointing. That means the servo testers are running at low clock rate on cheaper components. Does anyone know how channel five exp affects the express LRS receiver? What does arming the receiver really mean? Okay, what does arming the receiver? Let's let's talk about that. First off, arming the receiver, it does a couple of things. It allows the receiver to go into dynamic power mode. So if you're not, if the receiver doesn't receive an arm signal, it won't run dynamic power. Uh, it'll, it'll stay, I think the behavior is it stays where it's set. So whatever the low value is, it stays there. It won't go into dynamic power mode. Of course, you can bypass that by setting the power mode to say 250 or, you know, 300 Watts or whatever, you know, you can raise it. So that's the first one. The second one is that if in the arm state, you can't make changes to the Lewis script. Like the Lewis script will ignore changes. Not that you should be monkeying around while you're flying an aircraft with the Lua anyway, but if it's in an arm state, it doesn't, it doesn't let you do the Lewis script. And there are a couple of other little things that go on, but it's not, don't think of it like beta flight, right? Beta flight, when you are in beta flight, lots of stuff happens. It, it tries to get a GPS signal. Um, it starts calculating data for your flight information, your arm time, your flight time, your on time. Uh, you know, it starts doing that kind of thing. It actually does arm the motors at that point. Uh, so that's why when you turn, when you arm a beta flight or INAV computer, the motors will actually spin prior to that. They will not. So that there are some differences. It's not arming in the traditional sense that like on beta flight or INAV where actually the motors start doing things. That's not what arming means with express LRS. But if you go out and search on the GitHub for is armed, you'll see some text. We, we actually had a very long chat about it on discord one night and it kind of boils down to those two things, dynamic power and no changes to Lewis script. Now, if you want to set your dynamic power to 500 milliwatts and, and not change anything in your Lewis script, it's not going to stop you. It's not going to stop you. So it's not, yeah, it's not right. It's not like if you disarm, try it, you know, put your throttle on a channel and put your arming switch on something other than channel five, you know, like don't broadcast your arm your cutoff, your throttle cutoff, and then put your arming switch on channel five and try it. And you'll see what I mean. If you go in and you turn, you turn your throttle cut off so that the throttle will operate the propeller and the motor spins. Uh, so that's your throttle cut. If that works and then you, you disarm the receiver, your motor will not stop working. It's not like your motor stops working or that output stops going out to your devices. That's not what happens. It's more related to things like dynamic power and, um, and like I said, the Lewis script. So like I said, go on the discord and search for is armed the phrase I S A R M E D. And you'll see some dialogue. We had a chat about it. We, we looked at it line by line and honestly, I'm not going to coach or advocate for that, but you know, make your own decisions. That's all I can say. All right, guys. Well, that looks like the end of the questions and it is definitely the end of the content. And this one went pretty long tonight. I can tell you coming up, I'm going to give you some information about what's coming. I'm going to switch over to the big workspace. I got to show you guys something. Is this the one that I have it? I don't know. Maybe it's this one. It's, it's probably, is it this one? Yeah, there it is. There's a quick look at the, um, that's the slick. That's a 73 inch slick. 
I'm using a Sunny Sky 35cc motor on that. That spinner and the back plate came with the kit. That's a Skywing product I got from Northwest RC. That one's going to be, uh, I'm waiting for the servos. Uh, this is a sponsored, a sponsored video in terms of the servos. So I have servos inbound. They've been shipped. They're on the way. And as soon as I get them, I'll get them installed in the slick and we'll finish this up and do a build review. But that's the next one up in terms of airframe. And then in terms of flying, I'm, I'm looking for uh, we no flying this past weekend uh, due to weather. So this coming weekend might be a two fly day, maybe some fixed wing. And I'm hoping Freddie comes out with his Tron. He's got his Tron 5.5 and I'm really hoping he comes out with that. So we'll see. Uh, if not, you know, we'll maybe we'll see some Spectre, some Kraken. I don't know. We'll get some helicopter stuff in there some one way or another. But I do expect to do some flying this weekend and uh, we'll get a video done for that. And as soon as that slick is ready to go, uh, I'll get that one up in the air. I'm mainly waiting for the servos now, and it could still be another week or so because they're coming from China. So just have to hang tight and wait for those. But as soon as they get here, I'll get hard at work finishing this up. What I can tell you is some interesting stuff. I don't want to blow the video for, for the Skywing build review, but what I can tell you about this one is that I've been very impressed with the ease of assembly. They take care of a lot of stuff for you. I'll cover that detail when I do the build review, but uh, I've been very impressed so far with the amount of work they do that just just basically takes it off my plate, you know? So if, if uh, you know, if you want to build, this isn't the kind of stuff you're buying anyway. So, you know, if you just want to get the thing up and running and flying, then they do a lot of uh, neat time saving techniques on this airframe. So I've been impressed with it so far. All right, let me check the comments and we'll wrap it up. Thanks, John, for joining. Thanks all for joining. You're welcome, Hobie. Thanks for making it. I appreciate you joining. Terminal Insanity says, awesome stream. I love these. Well, glad. I'm glad to hear that, man. Thanks for joining. I like the questions, too. I like good, honest questions. You know, good conversational stuff where there's not an agenda. I love that stuff. So it's good It's good to see that. I like that type of interaction. So keep it coming, my friend. Uh, Robert says, another great show. Appreciate it, Robert. Thank you. I'm looking to buy some good servos. I've got some on the way. KST. They're KST. That's what's on the way. Jeff says, great video. John, thank you. You're welcome, Jeff. Thanks for the suggestions this week. I do appreciate that. You know, I do listen to you guys. You know, if you hear, if, if I hear a good idea, I'm, I'm all about it. So thanks for sharing your thoughts with me. Uh, Steven says, thanks for the info. Great show. Appreciate that. I didn't like Kelly's at first, but after watching this channel, I really want, man, they're fun. If you like to learn stuff and you want to, if you want to challenge yourself a little bit, I like building them and I'm, I'm having a blast flying them. So uh, it's, it's a challenge to be sure, but we've got really good people and get on our discord and ask questions in the Heli channel. You can get some help. Um, and then Hobie says, John got me into quads. That's right. Well, good, good. I'm glad uh, I like to hear you guys out flying stuff, man. That's what it's all about. That's what keeps the hobby going. Got to keep you guys the economic produ productivity in the hobby going. And that's what keeps the new products coming. And speaking of that, it keeps the uh, channel going when the patrons sign up and join me on patreon.com. So I appreciate you guys support on patreon.com because when you guys uh, help me with the burden of running the financial burden of running the channel, it really does help. I'm honest to God. It really does help. Uh, I do spend the money I get from Patreon and YouTube on the channel. It does not go into my wallet. I'm just telling you guys, it does not go into my wallet it goes into the channel so i appreciate your support and uh, you guys are definitely helping out with content so i appreciate that uh, jeff says check my latest crazy suggestion in the elrs discord hardware dev all right man i will i'll take a look all right fellas that's all i've got for tonight thanks for joining me i had a great time tonight i hope you did as well that's all i've got for today take it easy and get out there and fly something